Welcome to the Bloomberg Markets Podcast. I'm Paul Sweeney, alongside my co-host, Matt Miller. Every business day, we bring you interviews from CEOs, market pros, and Bloomberg experts, along with essential market-moving news. Find the Bloomberg Markets Podcast on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen to podcasts and at Bloomberg.com slash podcast. Let's go to our next guest, get right back to these markets. John Hurdle joins us, Executive Chairman at Hurdle Callahan and Company. Hey, John, we have a, a risk on day today, but there's still a lot of concern out there. September was a tough month for uh, risk assets, stocks uh, down. Uh, how do you guys think about the rest of this year? You know, it's still driven in large part by this Federal Reserve. How are you guys thinking about it? Well, we like to have a real yield in the bond portfolio for the first sure. time in a long time. You know, I uh, the first 30 years I was in the business, bonds were such a critical dimension of a diversified portfolio. And then we got to this place where we had no real yield and we needed the bonds to stabilize the portfolios. But the price of that stabilization was huge because we got no real yield. So as an investor, I like having real yield back in the bond market. I also feel like this is more of a stock picker's market. Uh, it's not just risk on, risk off. That's a term that has really become popular in the last 10 years. And it's more of a trading term than an investing term. We're always risk on because we think to fulfill our clients' missions, we've got to be in growth assets, which are stocks and private equity and so forth. So it's really a question. Uh, we're not, you know, we're investors, not traders. And so this market actually feels a little more normal than what we've gone through for the last 10 years. So what do you think um, in terms of the 60-40 split? Is that still the way to go for the average investor? Or would you allocate more to bonds right now at these yields? We wouldn't really allocate. We're not allocating more to bonds yet. And we've been about 70-30. So for a long time, we've been more growth oriented than fixed income than income oriented. Uh, but we are adding duration. So we feel like if we can move up duration and we're still underweight relative to the investment grade index but we're you know closer to matching it we're adding duration so we feel with a 10 year to 460 we're getting closer um you know could it get to a five percent interesting but at this point we can increase yield so get current yield um this the yield curve is steepening a little bit and if we do slip into a recession and interest rates drop again, then we get capital appreciation out of those bonds. So we're adding duration. John, on the, on the equity side here, you know, some of the, the performance or most of the vast majority, if not all of the performance in the S&P 500 has been from a handful of names, the Mag Magnificent Seven. Do you chase those here or do you try to look for some of the names that have not participated? Well, uh, you know, Mark Andreessen wrote years ago that software is eating the world. Um, and so that is a secular change. It's kind of like the Industrial Revolution. On the other hand, Howard Marks says beautifully that there is no asset in the world that's a good investment at any price. Uh, it depends on the name. You've got to go name by name. And by the way, there are other companies that we like that are not tech. We do like the tech set. We like the U.S. Uh, relative to the world because of our exposure to technology. Uh, but really, when we think about the great technology companies like Microsoft, they have strong balance sheets, they have an installed base, and they have a moat around their business. There are other businesses like Thermo Fisher and Canadian Pacific Rail that aren't tech companies. Well, Canadian Pacific isn't a tech company per se, but it also has a strong balance sheet, installed base, and moat around its business. So, um, you know, it's not just tech companies, but it, we think it's companies that have that kind of a strong position uh, and can manage through these uncertain times. Are you concerned about, you know, we talked so much about the fact that inflation um, was helpful to earnings, and now if we're in a disinflationary environment, will that hurt earnings? Maybe. <laughs> you know, markets are always priced at equilibrium. So every time I sell something, someone's buying it from me, and every time I buy something, someone's selling it from, to me. So it's, there's this notion that there's always a positive and negative story right. and interest rates you know five years ago we were desperate to get interest rates higher and the right. fed just couldn't get it done and then you know we had this yep. covid situation and probably the, the six trillion dollars right. hey john we're gonna have to i'm sorry we're gonna have to leave it there just because of time but we appreciate getting your thoughts john hurdle executive chairman at hurdle callahan and company you're listening to the team Catch our live program, Bloomberg Markets, weekdays at 10 a.m. Eastern on Bloomberg.com, the iHeartRadio app, and the Bloomberg Business app, or listen on demand wherever you get your podcasts. 
All right, Tom Farley joins us here. He's the chief executive officer of Bullish, uh, former president of the New York Stock Exchange, uh, here to chat with us. Hey, Tom, first of all, thanks for joining us. Um, tell us about what you guys are doing at Bullish. Uh, great to great to be on with you. I am soaked, by the way. <laughs> I heard you talking about the rain. I I just uh, I just walked into the office from a meeting and am completely drenched. <laughs> there you go. So I'm glad this I'm glad this is radio. Um, but you're on Zoom as well. We got you on uh, YouTube. Uh, we got uh, you uh, out on YouTube. There you go, uh -oh. my man. <laughs> great to be with you guys. Yeah, bullish. Um, look, we, we from the outset we're we're taking an approach of being a. a compliant adult digital assets exchange and that that didn't really benefit us to be honest with you in 18 19 20 it felt like uh the exchanges that, that were winning in many in many cases uh were kind of cutting corners and doing things differently than we were doing but in the long run it'll it'll you know it'll work out um in many ways paul guys like you and i you know that people might look at and say our granddads but we've been in markets <laughs> for all this time we, we've seen the future and the professional financial services businesses will win in the digital asset space there will be two to four uh global exchanges not five not one and they will be well-run businesses and so we've just focused on institutions only fully regulated did coins that actually make sense you know everybody loves a a, a frog coin or, or or digital animal drawing or what have you but what i'm really looking for are the projects that are adding real value in the world that are benefiting from blockchain technology to do good things to make for a more efficient financial market and so those are the areas we've been focusing on bullish and it's it's working we're gaining market share we're the number two exchange in the world for eth we're on any given day three four or five for for bitcoin which are you know, obviously, two of the big the big ones out well, there. Well, I'm definitely not a granddad. I want to point out that Tom Farley was born <laughs> after the Beatles broke up. So, okay. uh, uh, you did though, uh, Tom. Which, by the way, in crypto, in crypto, it makes me a great granddad. <laughs> exactly. In, I, in honestly, crypto I, you years. know, when I first I, I I got into this back in 2012, but it was it was through an investment uh, in in Coinbase pre revenue. Got I got lucky to be honest. But kind of learn the space and then immerse myself in ninth, uh, 2020 and it was like the jargon the inscrutable jargon and i would say like that doesn't make any sense and people would look at me like literally like i was a, a thousand years old like oh you'll just never get it that's why they make up that kind of jargon by the way uh <laughs> i've been following crypto uh, for about the exact same time i bought my first bitcoin in december of I guess 2013, December of 2013 was when I got nice my first trade one for six hundred dollars. Um, well, he but, lost it. The key, though. <laughs> I, I did lose my out. password. But uh, Tom, you were pretty busy at the time running the New York Stock Exchange, which is arguably you know the most important um, exchange in the world. Certainly, historically, it is. Uh, how have you used what you learned at ICE and at NYSE um, in the world of crypto? Oh my gosh, like a, like a million ways, um, especially now, you know, coming out of all the shenanigans of, of, of 2021 and 2022 and people being hurt and, um, you know, deception, outright fraud in some cases, people now care about credit worthy counterparties. They care about businesses being run the right way. And look, I, I'd love to tell you what we're doing at Bullish is like, you know, solving differential equations, but it's not. It's connecting buyers and sellers and ensuring that you have a lot of bids and offers tightly, tightly wrapped around the market price. And that's what I've done since I was 28 years old, or 29 years old, um, when I when I went into the New York Board of Trade, which is what could be a whole nother radio hour <laughs> to talk about a 29 year old kid trying to break up floor trading um, but let's leave that aside hey, Tom. Um, it's really it's really the same it's really the same thing in fact in some ways it's easier you know at, at the New York Stock Exchange we were we were processing a hundred million messages a second in our options feed hundred million messages a second in crypto if you're doing five thousand a second you you get a gold medal so in some ways it's it's easier some ways it's it's more difficult but every day all day I'm benefiting from the great people that I learned from in in exchange world my whole my whole career Tom, how frustrating is it to you and maybe just the crypto market in general when it still feels like 
traditional financial Wall Street, if you will, global banking, if you will, still does not really recognize or appreciate crypto. I mean, Jamie Dimon's still not on board, just for an example. How do you put that in context? Uh, I mean, you know, it's interesting. It's a good question. And, and you know, Warren Buffett, I, I would add to that. I mean, th these yep. are these are people I, I think highly of. Um, but when you drill into their message, I, I actually share a lot of their concern. You know, they were, especially Jamie, was talking at the height of the mania and kind of saying, hey, I've seen this movie before. Yep. Um, and and look, to, to some extent, he was right. And, and we as an industry have brought the uncertainty that we're in right now upon us. It was, as I said, it was too much jargon. It was too much deception. There were too many frog coins. Um, so, so it was right. On the, at, the, at the same time, J.P. Morgan uh, is, is, is doing projects to benefit from the interesting technological facets of blockchain. You know, the finality, the, the, the instant finality or instant settlement, the transparency that goes along with blockchain, the incremental security that goes along with blockchain. Um, J.P. Morgan engages in uh, brokerage for and, 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 and prime, bro uh, prime brokerage or, or futures kind of commission business for Bitcoin or Bitcoin futures on the CME. So I, I think really what you were seeing from some smart. Look, there were some people who just don't get it. They, they, they think Bitcoin's going to go away tomorrow. Bitcoin ain't going away anytime. But there's but there were some people, I think, who just sensed something wasn't right. And there was some merit to that. And this is a time of retrenchment. And I have a lot of hope, maybe even optimism, that we've bumped along along the bottom and things are getting a lot better quickly. Hey, Tom, thanks so much for joining us. Really appreciate you taking the time there. Tom uh, Farley, CEO of Bullish, the former president at the NYSE, talking about the crypto space and the exchanges that support uh, the crypto space. And as Tom was suggesting, uh, they've got some work to do, arguably, as an industry to kind of shore up uh, a lot of aspects of that market. Man, 10 years ago, if you had the choice between JP Morgan stock and Bitcoin. Boom. <laughs> <laughs> You're listening to The Tape. Catch our live program, Bloomberg Markets, weekdays at 10 a.m. Eastern on Bloomberg Radio, the TuneIn app, Bloomberg.com, and the Bloomberg Business app. You can also listen live on Amazon Alexa from our flagship New York station. Just say, Alexa, play Bloomberg 1130. Again, I'm looking at the two-year here. I can just jump into a two-year treasury, 5.03%. I think on a rainy day like today, that's just fine. Dude, me. you're all in on the two-year. I'm all in I on the two-year. I keep telling you there's reinvestment risk there. I'll deal with that when it happens. I'm, and I'm all I feel about like today. you get the Literally same from a money market, you know, that, that rolls over for you. Yeah. You know, I am your daughter's I am in the Marcus, Marcus account. I'm in that one with her. Oh, you're in that. So yeah, they, I matched her. So we uh, we so, doubled up on that. Uh, my wife gets in it, and then she recommends all her friends. And every time she recommends somebody, she gets a bump on her rate. Nice. That's a nice incentive there. Yeah. I guess that's how my daughter did it. Um, anyway, uh, Ben Emmons joins us because he's a professional. He's head of fixed income with New Edge Wealth. Ben, do I buy the two-year here, or do you, you got something better for me? So I would agree with you, Paul, that if you take the two-year yield and you were to subtract any of the core measures that we saw today, yep. it's actually positive real return. That's right. We're getting real yield these days, right? Right. Okay. So that for that reason, I'd say, yes, you should, because you don't have the duration risk. You may have to have reinvestment risk, but you certainly get compensated for inflation. So that's good. Okay. And either way, out the yield curve, I still remain relatively skeptical. I think a 10-year or 30-year bond just not enough compensation there yet we may get there you know if we hit that five percent level which i think we're going but i think your best bet is on the front of the curve I, we see almost that on the 20 year don't we i mean yep. i feel like do you see yields going much higher out out the curve so that depends on a few things matt that it depends one on obviously the message of the fed coming out of all this data we're getting now is what what's higher for longer is it still higher and then longer or are we at the high I think there's a mixed message on this from the Fed currently, or as in- There is, because Powell says, on one hand, in a press conference, he'll say, we're not gonna cut rate for years. And he, there's an S on the end of that year. So <laughs> right. he means multiple, not just one year. We're not gonna cut rates for years. Then I look at the dot plot and I see two rate cuts scheduled for next year. Not scheduled. Uh, I, I realize they're just Forecast. prognoses, but-, yeah. Prognosis. but the majority of the Federal Reserve expects to cut twice next year. Were they not listening to Powell or are they not on the same page as Powell? So actually that forecast changed the last meeting because there were people predicting 100 base points cuts. So they took some of that back. 
which I think, by the way, explains a lot of the yield movement we have seen of the last period. It's just the Fed has acknowledged this is a stronger economy, so it depends on that too. But the economy, Katisha showed its resilience, yep. including today's data. You can, you know, it's softening, it's cooling, but it's not collapsing in any sort of way. Lastly, we do have a, I think, a supply-demand imbalance, so to speak, in the Treasury market. As in, we got tons of supply, and we're seeing this change in demand. Maybe your colleague Ira Jersey has some interesting, right. specific analysis on that. I would echo more that uh, that you know the supply is is large, and it looks like that they want to continue to issue more long-term bonds. So, I think. All those factors drive you to that that five percent barrier. Now, how high from there? Who knows? But I think five percent is sort of the psychological number. <laughs> what you know? I just been fascinated with uh, energy, global energy prices. WTI crude oil here. We're off about a half a percent today, but still above ninety one dollars a barrel. It's had a just a real big move off that high sixties we had uh, just several months ago. Um, and boy, that's inflationary. How, how do you think about? energy prices and how does that kind of factor into I guess the economy yeah it, it certainly is Paul because you know the the data today in the PC basket too showed an increase of, of, of energy there and uh, just like in CPI yep. so at some point people are going to take notice of it and factor that again in, in their expectations so that's one issue you know Goolsby in his speech yesterday made a real point about that saying like if you know if we continue to have disinflation on the right path if people expect differently from inflation in the future, we may have to adjust policy, right? So there's that issue. And then I think it's about how high will oil prices go before we're getting a real impact on the economy? Because the past is, I think, a good guide there. If high oil prices were to surge and spike high, then it, it's going to slow down activity. People are going to pare back. It just seems to be always a, a factor for slowdown. Nonetheless, it will be inflationary because we're still in a very high inflation environment. We have seen, or we haven't seen, I should say, gas prices keep up with oil prices. And I'm not talking about at the pump, you know, I'm talking about the RBOB futures contract. It's right. um, not taken off at the same rate. Do you think that means that oil prices, is this just a spike and they're going to come back down or are they holding at this level? I think it's the spike because of the kind of little specific technical features in the oil market currently. I think what's happening there is that people recognize that the oil production costs cuts are really filtering through the global system. So you got to watch the crack spreads, Paul. Right, crack well, spreads. I'm just learning RBOB. That's a new one for me. Yeah. Oh, really? What is, that's gasoline futures? Yes. Gasoline futures, yeah. Why? Yeah, so, again, just to re ask his question again, why is it going down? So I think that is a supply issue there. Okay. And, and it was reported yesterday there was some additional supply there. So it is very much sensitive okay. to that. Whereas with oil, it's the opposite uh, situation. You know, John Farrell on, on surveillance made this point this morning. We actually have high oil production in the United States. We just got low inventories at Cushing for all kinds of reasons. So the draw on that inventory pushes up the price. But once it gets back flooded in, with the oldest oil production. I mean, Cushing, that's in Oklahoma, right? Yeah. And they have like the tanks, and that's Central. where all the pipelines go yeah. in and out. Central Hub, yeah. I gotta get the, have you been to Cushing? Oh, no, no, I haven't. <laughs> Alex Steele goes oh, and hangs out down all there. All the time, uh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> the Alex's are, I wanna go there, because that seems yeah. like a, the pretty, if you wanna see how the sausage is made in, in global energy, yeah. that's that, that's where you go. So, it, so energy, in, inflationary impact, is it something that's more temporary in, from your perspective? So, I mean, you have to watch headline inflation because eventually if it gets higher headline, then it will spill over to an extent in core. You know, Bloomberg has a very nice tracking of headline real time, and it has moved up again. It's ticked higher after a whole period of decline. So I think we just have to watch this, where this is going. As I said, like, I think that if you're getting a real spike in oil prices, say we go well over 100, mm -hmm. that it has a psychological yep. effect on, on consumers. I, I don't understand why more people aren't worried about the strike um, dragging on because okay there's inventory now but and because they built up before the strike inventory, inventory of, cars. of cars yep yep but if they strike for longer um, that inventory is going to get whittled away and we're already at a pretty high level in terms of car prices new car prices used car prices have been heading down but that's going to turn around for sure and then you get 150,000 people who are going to get a 30 percent raise if this works out right um then other people are gonna want that kind of raise too, or something close. So you've got 
both the cost of goods, which to me are the most important goods, cars, and um, <laughs> wages. As opposed to bread and water. Rising. <laughs> that's got to be inflationary, hasn't it? Yeah, it, it echoes a bit to the 70s idea, right? Of in, you have unions getting successful in negotiating higher wages, so other unions are going to try that too. We've seen some evidence of it now. We have higher energy prices, and people reacting to those energy prices with unions demanding wages, part of it. So I won't say there's a spiral here yet, but there's some of that element happening. And I think overall a strike should not disrupt the economy too much. Like the California strike was five billion to the California economy, but nothing to the to the US economy. So the so what's your base case for next year, Ben? Are we gonna have a recession? I'm not in that camp. I think the economy is holding up so soft far. Soft landing still. So, still that softer landing, that idea that we have See? too much of investment pushed in the economy from the Inf uh, Inflation Reduction Act and the CHIPS Act and the, and the Infrastructure Act. That's just really coming through. But in that case, you don't probably see Fed cuts. Why would the Fed yeah. cut if we have a soft landing? No, I, 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 think it's, it, I think that is where I'm coming in my 5% yield scenario. Yeah. So at a four and a half currently at the 10 year, the 50 base points forecasted in Fed, in Fed, by the Fed, it's probably going to be taken back too. If anything, if you look at that dot plot currently, the market is 50 base points away from the Fed's median. It's probably going to be again pulled up to the Fed's median. That will bring you to the 10 year, 5%. And even at that level, which is high, um, I wouldn't think that that would necessarily bring the economy to a recession. I want to make one final point, which is the, always the yield curve discussion on the recession. Yep. You know, we have been in an inverted yield curve now for a bit. It has been historically the harbinger of recession, at least right. a lot of studies. But I've noted that each time the yield curve gets inverted and then becomes initially flat, like every mm -hmm. old treasury yields are the same, that's when things become very uncertain. It's basically the bond market saying, I can pay the same yield for two years or for 30 years, but I don't know where it's going. Right. Pretty uncertain. And it historically has shown that after that moment, the economy does show a lot of weakness and slowdown. All right. So, well, you know, we have to watch that, right? Keep an eye on the yield curve as we like to do. Yeah. Ben Emmons, head of fixed income with New Edge Wealth. Uh, thanks so much for joining us. You're listening to The Team. Catch our live program, Bloomberg Markets, weekdays at 10 a.m. Eastern on Bloomberg.com, the iHeartRadio app, and the Bloomberg Business app. Or listen on demand wherever you get your podcasts. All right, let's talk about risk here. Uh, I look at the VIX. Matt doesn't like the VIX, but I look at the VIX because it's well, on I've my been, screen. I've been watching it a lot lately. 16.46. That is by no means in an area where people are freaked out about anything here. But, I, you know, the question is, are, is the market properly pricing in risk? No, it's not the 12 to 14 that it had been over the no, past. No, which was amazing. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Nimrit Kang joins us. Uh, Co-CIO and Senior Portfolio Manager at North Star Asset Management. Nimrod, I wonder, thanks so much for joining us, first of all. Wonder how you guys think about risk, manage risk in your portfolio here, because it's been a crazy few years here. Yeah, thank you for having me, Paul. And it's really interesting, actually, that you ask about risk, because at North Star, you know, the last time I was on, on the radio here with you, we were talking about how it's a Goldilocks economy, the markets are at all time highs. Just a month later, the market's down 7% from its highs. The We all know what's happened in the bond market with the rise in the 10 year yields. So when we at Northstar think about risk, we think about risk as our clients not being able to beat their financial goals and also not having their portfolios be in alignment with their values. The way we have approached risk is really think about what are the long-term trends that are in place. And that's where we think about some of this, you know, the big change in the monetary cycle that we have seen from the cost of money being free to actually having a price <laughs> on money. And how does that change things everywhere, right? And in, a, in juxtaposed to that, there's also some major secular trends in place um, that have been in place for decades, if not longer. And those are related to ecological reckoning. You know, we all know the extreme weather conditions we've been seeing. That's just the symptomatic of some of those trends that have been placed. Other one is related to aging demographics, again, been placed, but a big chunk of the population is entering the retirement age in the developed markets. And we're starting to see all that manifestation come through in the, you know, in the labor numbers and so forth. 
So for us, risk is really trying to understand what are we trying to do for the long term to achieve those goals for our, finan- uh, for our clients, but then also thinking about how do we boil it down to portfolio construction. And what do you and come I, up? What do you come up with there? I mean, we've been talking uh, for the last. Well, we had talked last year about the death of the sixty forty portfolio, but I guess this year it's been a, a pretty good deal. Yeah, you know, it's it's interesting you say that because we, especially on the fixed income side, we're looking at yields in agencies and so forth in the six percent range, right? Going out ten years, five, ten years. And if you really want to just hold those bonds to that point in the maturity and collect that 6% yield, that sounds pretty good. And for a lot of our clients, that makes sense in terms of meeting their objectives. Um, And then when we think about equities for us, it's about having a very high quality equity portfolio consisting of companies that are just great, you know, high quality, low debt. Um, you know, very good capital deployment run by capable management teams that are good stewards of capital and labor and that are providing those essential products and solutions, which we think there's going to be demand for, you know, going out five, 10 years. And that's really how we think about constructing those portfolios and thinking about risk. One of the things that we talk about a lot or has or is talked about a lot in financial uh, services over the last really four, five, six years has been ESG and, and, and the uh, and the development of that as, as, as a factor, I guess. It, how do you guys think about that? Because it seems like in the U.S. at least, it's kind of lost some momentum here. It's become a little politicized, I guess. Yes. So North Star has been doing socially responsible investing since 1990, right? Ooh, okay. And the way that we think about socially responsible investing is coming from a different perspective where we think that, you know, there is no company that is going to be socially responsible because the environment is evolving. Our sense of what's appropriate, what was appropriate 30 years ago is no longer acceptable, right? There's more and more things that are being demanded. The society is changing. So, but we can use our shareholder rights on behalf of our clients to advocate for positive change at these companies or for them to act in better ways, um, behave more responsibly as we would like to call it. So. You know, the, it, in some ways, Paul, if you think about in 1930s, the Financial Standards Accounting Board put in place that, you know, you had to report financials a certain way. ESG is a similar, there's the metrics. We don't think that you can look at, um, you can really understand how a company is shaping its environment or what it's doing by just looking at metrics, right? That's a starting point. We we fully support that there's standardization in the industry to that or to that account. But for us, it's really about making sure that the companies are uh, upholding what we call our five pillar framework, that they are in alignment with this uh, view that we have in terms of what they are doing to bridge the economic inequity you know, gender and racial equity, what are they doing in terms of human rights? What are they doing for environmental, um, all the different environmental aspects that we're looking at? And then what does that all say about their corporate governance? So it's not about ESG being in and out of fashion. It's about making sure that there are material risks out there and how do we incorporate that in our analysis, right? So if we fast forward, there's this huge, we noticed this this summer in itself was where we had extreme temperatures and all those different parts. Water is an area where there's more and more stress, water stress. How do we think about all those trends? It's it's not about a metric that's in fashion or not, it's the long-term sustainability and to ensure that we do get those um, uh, financial returns over long terms, they're not going to be there if the companies that we're investing in, their business models are threatened and they no longer can do business, right? Yep. So that's how we approach it here at North Star. Hey, Nimrit, thanks so much uh, for joining us and sharing your thoughts. We always appreciate that. Nimrit Kang, co-CIO and senior portfolio manager at North Star uh, Asset Management. Thanks for listening to the Bloomberg Markets Podcast. You can subscribe and listen to interviews at Apple Podcasts or whatever podcast platform you prefer. I'm Matt Miller. I'm on Twitter at MattMiller1973. And I'm Paul Sweeney. I'm on Twitter at PT Sweeney. Before the podcast, you can always catch us worldwide at Bloomberg Radio.